Hello, everyone, and welcome to Med Hedos Nerd Podcast, episode eight. I am your host, Vika Slanyan, and as always, I'm joined by my aristocratic co host, Mike Balian. You said it right. I did. You said Look it at right. that. Look at that. I've been practicing. I can't wait to get you that t shirt. <laughs> Where we dive deep into our great Armenian history and discuss different eras, kingdoms, topics, and great people. How are you doing this fine Saturday morning? I'm great, other than the fact that my voice is absolutely obliter- obliterated. Yeah, well, one, I mean, this is unusual for us to record on a Saturday morning. We typically record Thursday nights around 7 p.m. And because of your voice situation, we yes. postponed it. I so, know, I didn't have COVID. T- we had <laughs> our good old friend, the flu. The flu. Yeah, you that, remember that? Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, 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 remember that yeah, guy? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I know we're usually, you know, we got the cognac going. So today it's coffee. Yeah, yeah coffee. That's AM, right. AM drinkage. Yeah. Not, so. not grandpa's old cough medicine. <laughs> <laughs> um, bef- our main topic today, uh, well, on uh, September 21st, it was the uh, 30th Independence Day of the Republic of Armenia, our homeland, our country. And um, because of that, we were, you know, researching topics to, for this episode, and we decided to do the history of the capital, Yerevan. Uh, we all have a special spot in our hearts for Yerevan. You know, I was born in Yerevan, and uh, till the age of nine, you know, my memories are still there from my childhood, my school friends. Um, so, you know, and I know you've been there. Yeah, uh, I've been multiple there, times. I've been there more times than I can yeah, count. I know. You yeah. weren't born there, right? You no, were born here, yeah. No, I was born here in L.A., but uh, my parents were from Yerevan. Yeah. So um, that's what the main topic is going to be. Um, and before we start, uh, we want to actually mention something so uh, important. The Popok Animation uh, fundraiser that we're doing, which we donated um uh, was it two or three computers? Um, three, I believe two. Three, two, yeah, two computers on our end, uh, and we also helped uh, raise money towards it. Uh, Mike is also going to be involved in teaching uh, 3D uh, sculpting uh, via online, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and this whole thing was put together. We came together with Miasin.org and Fred, who was involved. He's the one who you know, kind of brought everybody together. So Fred, thank you, Fred, for Fred, doing that. Um, Fred Goliath the Great. Yeah, Maria from miasin.org. Mm-hmm. She is amazing, all the hard work she does. So um, the the good news is we reached our goal of $30,000. Uh, all the computers have been purchased. Um, everything's set to go. Um, so the ball's rolling. I think the classes are going to start soon. They have a lot of kids who signed up uh, signed up already. So yeah, uh, we're uh, thank you to everyone who donated and helped. Uh, it means a lot to us. So uh, this is a great project, and it's going to help a lot of kids have uh, some way of a craft, I guess you can say, in in, in their lives, and, and it's going to help them get good pay jobs, um, and just help the economy all over in in Armenia, and and for these kids not to leave their homeland to be able to work and. Arvan is, you know, working hard to bring major projects into Armenia for, with animations. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's it's really good. It's really good to see something. I mean, look, we are a talented people. We we sculptures, architecture. I mean, everything, music. almost anything, everything, right? And yeah. uh, we're going to touch on that actually in this episode just a yeah. little bit. Um, but moving into the digital phase of things and seeing all the movies that are being made and shows and whatnot that have so much heavy digital content, right? Yeah. Um, it would be incredible for Armenia to be one of those hubs that outsources work from a lot of the major markets around the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, the second thing I want to mention is we did release our third sculpture, which is Queen Oshren, the first Christian queen of Armenia. Um, if you haven't seen it, go to our Instagram page, which is at medhedosned, and, uh, it is available for pre-order, uh, for $1.99. This is a full body sculpture. It's not a bust. We just didn't feel right doing a bust for a female. Well, also we were tired of posting our ugly faces on our Instagram account. So finally we needed a very attractive woman on there. Are you calling me ugly? I'm calling me ugly. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 
You're guilty by association. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, my wife's going to be calling you. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So, again, it's a full body figure and, and it looks amazing. Obviously, you know, I get to see the, the process and uh, all the research that uh, we did and Mike did. And it just, you know, but the way I saw it come together from what it was to what it is now it is just it's stunning guys you have to go see it um again these are all collectibles um so uh there are pre-orders um we are going to try to get this going as soon as possible Mm -hmm. uh we are working on the fourth one and our goal is hopefully by the holidays we'll have all four available for shipping um we're working on the whole production obviously everybody knows in the u.s with this whole shortage of materials with the containers and just lack of materials it is oh it is so stressful to uh to deal with this hopefully things uh start easing down and uh, we can move a lot faster um so uh like i said our main topic today is the history of yerevan which is the capital of armenia so just to give you guys a brief uh, a brief introduction uh, about uh, the city of Yerevan, um, the official establishment of Yerevan dates back to 782 BC when King Argishti I of Ararat laid the foundation of the fortress of Erebuni. The cuneiform inscription citing the date of the establishment of this fortress is among those inscriptions that have been preserved. Yerevan is situated in a beautiful and historic Ararat Valley on the banks of the Harazdan River. I used to go fishing in the Harazdan River just to really? let you know. Yeah, my dad would pick me up after school and we go fishing. We, both of us, uh, we hope that one day you will get to visit the city of Yerevan and have a better understanding of our great capital and uh, what it truly means to be Armenian. Imagine like the warm rays of the Ararat Valley have shaped the native people of the sacred land of Ararat. Um, And and something as an Armenian, you you feel it inside, you know. Um, When when you visit, you will be treated as an honored guest by virtually every Yerevanian with their true genuine hospitality. And the Armenian folkways will give you a taste of the real Armenian flavor. And yeah, that is I mean, so true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Like you kind of, anybody that I've ever known, I don't think I've ever talked to a single yeah. human being that's ever gone to Yerevan and said, wow, I had a horrible time. Yeah. They've all come back saying the food, the people, yeah. the hospitality. Yeah. Is and, and, incredible. you know, and it's like they come back feeling like kings and queens. One thing about our culture, um, you know, we, I meant, we kind of joked about this last episode about the whole John um i don't think you can come across one armenian to another armenian that would announce their name to the other or or call their name with just straight let's say mike or Vic or or anything it's always john and that john that that term of endearment and we might be strangers it doesn't yeah, matter it it's might one thing you within can, five seconds of you meeting yeah the and, second and they it's get just, to know your name yeah i mean just automatic. knowing they're armenian yeah. and it's like you get their name it's john after that and yeah. it's an awkward feeling I've, I've experienced this in so many uh ways where i mean in jamaica where i met a young woman who was actually working there she was a transfer student and i mean the minute we met her and it was just John right away. And I don't know what it is about Armenians. We just feel like somehow we're brothers and sisters, no matter what it is, where mm-hmm. you are. Um, so I, 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 we hope, we hope you get to feel that, um, I guess, emotion that warmth. we feel, the warmth. So definitely, if you haven't been to uh, Yerevan, it uh, doesn't matter, Armenian or you know, not Armenian, go. Go experience it. You will you will not regret it we're not sponsored by any travel agents <laughs> just want to clear that up because that was an amazing pitch to yeah, go to get him yeah, on. yeah 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 well, do you know any armenian uh, <laughs> travel agents we should <laughs> well there's yeah. plenty well there's we can plenty. start one um sure. i mean we're doing everything else so um just uh talk about a quick really quick uh uh trip to basically about the early history um, uh, of Yerevan. Uh, the city of Yerevan is one of the oldest continuously inhabited settlements in the world. 
Archaeologists have unearthed many tools dating back to the Stone Age, most notably in the Shengavit district of modern Yerevan. These tools were made by the early hunters and gatherers as weapons for hunting, defense, and also dissecting meat of the hunted animals. Yeah, so getting into the foundation, since we were, talk we're talking about the early phases of, of the coming of Yerevan, yeah. in 782 BC, King Argishi I built the outpost fortress of Erebuni on the Arinbert hilltop in the heart of the Ararat Valley. The king ordered a special cuneiform inscription to be made in order to preserve and verify his deed in the annals of history. The inscription tells us the time and place where the fortress was built. You remember how in um, the episode of, uh, I believe, in Urartu, the yeah. kingdom of Urartu? Yeah, episode two. Yeah, where we talked about how there were so many cuneiform inscriptions around that whole area yeah. that literally document everything that was done back then. Yeah. You know? So, anyway, moving forward, a few decades later, another fortress was built in the vicinity of modern Yerevan, named after Taishiba or Teshub, supreme trinity of Ararat's exoteric pantheon of gods to be worshipped by the people. Ancient inscriptions on Teshubaini um, in the Middle Ages show a battle axe and a war hammer as symbols of the deity who ruled the land. The fortress city was built to improve the link of the trade routes. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting. It sounds like, almost sounds like Thor, right? <laughs> Back to the movies yeah, again. It is. Hey, man. Hey, look, a lot of movie yeah, references. We gotta stop with these movies. <laughs> no, we're not stopping with the movie references because it's it's, it's kind of cool. Well, people would, should go Google and to see the the, the images I, of it. Sure. To, to yeah, have yeah. a better idea, you know what what we're talking about. Obviously, you know. A visual aid don't, helps. Don't mind me with my movie references. It's it's the same thing I would do in a normal conversation with anybody. Is uh, Superman in this? <laughs> I don't know. We still have to find out. <laughs> I don't Batman. know. Maybe Hike. Oh, Maybe Hike, Hike might be yeah. that way. Yeah. And we'll figure yeah. it out when we talk about him. All right. Anyhow, the Teshebaini settlement on the Armenian plateau is one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. It shows the extent of trade and commerce that must have existed between the different city states of the ancient world. Yeah. The settlement of Teisha Baini is located in the vicinity of the Karmir Belur area of Yerevan. Among many accomplishments of the Armenian civilization during the period was the construction of elaborate long water canals. There's those water canals you were pointing to. 80, 80 kilometers? 72. 80. All right, we're going to have to look into this again. Yeah, well. The canals were sometimes directly carved right through the cliffs, which is an amazing feat. It still yeah. blows my mind every time we mention it um, as to what they did. If you guys ever want to go check it out, it's pretty incredible yeah. um, that ancient people managed to carve through solid stone. And I mean, rock. just just the, their their knowledge of being able to do this and to you know for the whole water irrigation system, you yeah. know, it's it's uh, and uh, obviously this was passed on through different civ civilizations. And if you ever get to go see them, they're amazing. It's just it's mind blowing the things they did back then. Well, to their credit, to out all of our credits as humans, we would do anything for water when you need it. Of course, of course, <laughs> like yeah. literally anything yeah. for water. <laughs> Um, the struggle with the elements was harsh and made Armenian Highlanders a tough and determined people. Um, all of the harshness and difficulty only made them stronger and more determined to fight for a better life. A cuneiform inscription in honor of the founding of Erebuni Fortress was also recorded in the Khorhorian Monument in Van, the capital of Ararat. Interestingly enough, throughout those long centuries of invasions and wars that were fought on the territory of, territories of Armenia, Yerevan to a certain extent, um, with all the downfalls continued to be inhabited to even modern day or yeah. modern days. Yeah, yeah. That that kind of um, leads us, you know, we're going to obviously skip some, you know, uh, eras well, and stuff. We're moving we're, forward, we're moving forward yeah, the yeah. timelines. Yeah. So we want to um, kind of cover the Middle Ages. Um, and according to historical writings, the Arsacid dynasty ruled Armenia for nearly 400 years from the middle of the first century to the first half of the fifth century. Under their rule, Yerevan prospered due to the fact it lay on the important roads connecting east with the west. And again, there you go. This is, we've talked about this in trade routes, you know, previous episodes about the trade routes, just in general for Armenia and how um, they, they, when they built their cities, they built them in positions where it was 
beneficial, you know, like the Silk Road, basically. Mm -hmm. So moving on, the Arsacid royal house was overthrown by the Armenian Nakharars, who wanted more decentralized power and resented the monarchy. Um, during the Middle Ages, Yerevan, along with other parts of Armenia, were virtually in a never-ending warfare against different foreign invaders. A revival took place during the restoration of the kingdom by the Bagratid dynasty between the 9th and the 11th century. The Sasanians established the Nakharar system, which did not restore the kingdom, but rather was based on the local rule of the Nakharars under the suzerainty of the Sasanians. You know, the whole Nakharar concept, it, it was just basically um, almost, I imagine it like they just kind of divided up you know like regions to themselves and you know this this portion is mine this portion is yours and they were just kind of like almost like kind of fat cat yeah, <laughs> mafia style you know it's, it's just, like it's, yeah. it's the same thing with anything in history you go find yeah. land you you settle it and then somebody somewhere who has a little bigger voice i guess call it that ends yeah. up the stakes staking claim to like this is our land this is yeah. who we are and we shall tax everybody yeah. Um, Baghdadid rule was succeeded by the Armenian nobility of the Zakarians. The new Baghdadid capital, the great city of Ani, was still relatively close to Yerevan. Many Armenians retreated to the safety of their elite in Lesser Armenia and Cilician Armenia. Nomadic invaders from Central Asia posed a serious threat to the overall progress of the Armenian civilization. So basically, you know, and we've covered this through uh, other episodes, it's always been that threat from from the Turkic the tribes, mm -hmm. the outside constantly, um, which has been a big problem for, throughout our history. It's always been under attack, which uh, we, this is kind of leading us into the foreign rule and the national uh, liberation movement, um, which kind of... It started around the 6th century or so, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it basically turned into, I guess, call it the wild, wild west in our in our sense, where, yeah. um, you know, you had all these tribes trying to move into our area. But um, beginning from that 6th century, waves of nomadic tribes, Turkic tribes specifically, from Central Asia began destructive raids into the Armenian plateau, the Caucasus and the Near East. Um, the savage nature and their lifestyle showed little care of human for human lives and human civilization. Cities, towns, villages were looted and obliterated. Large migrations took place out of Greater Armenia to other places, to Europe and beyond. Many Armenians um, fled to Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, and uh, Ukraine, and Western Europe. Yerevan's inhabitants were no exception to this. The migrations and many in it feared for their lives and left. Um, in the 15th century, the Ottoman Turks invaded and plundered Yerevan. The Ottoman Turks and later the Safavid Iranians fought for control of Armenia from the 16th to the late 18th century. During this period, a great number of nomadic Turkic tribes ravaged the settled towns and cities of Armenia. In the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, Plans for liberating the Armenian people and Armenia from foreign oppression were made in secret meetings organized by the Catholicus of the Holy See, which is located in Kilikia or yeah. Cilicia. The Armenian nobility, headed by the powerful David Peck and Mahitar Sparapet, and the emerging aristocracy were at the heart of the secret meetings. Yeah. David Peck, um, it's funny. Uh, my son's name is David. And, uh, because of. Uh, I've, I'm a big fan of David Beck and um, we just like the name but funny thing is his grandpa uh, that's what he calls him he calls him David, David Beck. Beck David Beck yeah. should we do an art piece of David we'll Beck? get there we're gonna get there I just get a little excited yeah don't worry now this is, is gonna lead us into kind of discuss the province of uh, Yerevan Yerevan was liberated after long centuries of foreign rule by the Russian Imperial Army, uh, as well as a large contingent of Armenian militia in 1828. After many unsuccessful charges, the fortress of Erevan, um, you know, they it used to be Erevan, yeah. um, older version of Yerevan, uh, which evolved from the original Ereban or Erebuni, uh, finally fell. 
Most of Eastern Armenia passed through Russia with the Treaty of Turkmenistan, was which was actually signed in Iran in 1813, and the Gulistan Treaty signed actually in Artsakh, 1828, soon after. Roads and railroads opened up Yerevan to new trade and industry, and it began to join the industrial revolution that was spreading throughout the world from the beginning of the 19th century. However, it still remained a sleepy town at the turn of the century with around about 30,000 people. It's crazy, right? When you look at, if anyone's been to Yerevan lately, it's really any big city. When you really think about how little the inhabitation was and yeah. what it grew into. Well, Armenia total is what, about 3 million people? 3 plus. And I think yeah. 2.9 are in Yedevon. <laughs> it's much less than that. Yeah. Yeah. But it yeah. seems like that. When was it the last time I went yeah. to Armenia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I was in Yedevon, I had a bunch of friends basically explain to me that Yedevon's just one gigantic village. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's kind of interesting that they look at it that way. <laughs> Well, uh, in the 18th century and early 19th century, Armenia was part of the Russian Empire and one of the major cities of the region was Tiflis or Tiflis or Tbilisi, established by Armenian merchants in the Middle Ages. Baku, very important, Baku, Shushi, which is the heart of Artsakh, and Gyumri, where run by elected Armenian mayors and had majority of Armenian population up until the end of the 19th century. So, you know, it, it shows how widespread Armenians were. And, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about Baku, you know, Azerbaijan. Uh, there were lots of Armenians there. Well, you, you know, know in, in previous episodes, we've covered how those areas that is now known as Azerbaijan is, yeah. was, I mean, it's pretty much been inhabited by our people for thousands of years. Yep. yep. You know? Um, Yerevan remained a small town until gradually, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, new factories were established in 1881 by the Russian magnate Nikolai Shustov, who drew more peasants, who basically became factory workers, to places like Yerevan. Um, For example, he's actually known for uh, the Yerevan brandy factory, which later on uh, evolved, you know, through... It, there's been name changes, which is now Ararat, mm-hmm. which is the cognac we drink. Yes. Yeah. You know, so there's history in that. Um, uh, the neighborhoods and new streets were constructed in the first few decades of the 20th century. Yeah. it's It sounds like, you know, it turned into a bustling hub, if you will, through numerous settlements, at least, at least what, in the 18th, 19th century? Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if if you research and look at old pictures of Yerevan uh, from the 1800s to 1900s, like you see that industrial revolution, how it took place and, and the construction and everything that happened, you know, as far as the development of the city. Well, yeah, there was, I mean, you know, if we know anything about the 18th century and the 19th century, you know, the special, specifically with the uh, advent of, you know, machinery and whatnot things started to blow up globally right yeah. like all over the world uh, it's just interesting to see and to go through the process or see the process of what happened with Yerevan through this time yeah um which leads us into some dark times as you all know um anytime and i've said this before anytime we go into you know some sort of enlightenment or or you know renaissance period we seem to have a dark period that follows speaking about these dark times um one major dark time as we you know we'll often refer to um is the genocide and on june 28th 1914 the archduke of austro-hungarian empire franz ferdinand was assassinated in sarajevo as we all know that's what kicked off world yeah, war one because war. because there was a lot of turmoil if if we all know our world war one history or pre-world war one history there was a lot of turmoil in the area and it was it got to the point where if one thing happened amongst any one of those countries that and empires yeah. that were still involved at the time yeah it was going to set something off yeah. and this which happened did. To be, yeah which, which yeah. Would, then this was it the armenian genocide took the lives of 1.5 million innocent men women and children waiting for the right time to execute the final solution of the armenian question the world war became a cover of sorts and basically served as a gruesome backdrop for the genocide. So they used the great war yeah. 
to accomplish what they already had in mind, right? And I'm gonna yeah, get to it that was in the a cloak. second. It was the cloak yeah. to hide what was happening uh, behind, uh, you know, the whole war, World War War, yeah. uh, World War One. They were, you know, using that as a excuse, I guess. Well, and, I mean, you know, all the all the World War One fronts where all, most of the battles were fought were on European soil. Yeah, you know, yeah, there were skirmishes all over the globe, but at the same time it was a perfect opportunity for them to kind of clean house, if you will. Yeah. Right. So one of the euphemistic names that the criminals who masterminded the first genocide of modern history was, and I quote, the Committee of Union and Progress, CUP, adopting the racist policy of pan-Turkism, an agenda from Europe to Siberia, as this is how they dreamed of it, pretty much. The plan of extermination of a whole race and a murder of a nation. The word genocide was in fact invented by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish lawyer who noted that the best example of the genocide in modern history is the Armenian genocide. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, this whole, you know, the, the pan-Turkism uh, ideology, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's it was there during the genocide. It was there before the genocide um, and it's there till today. And it's, it's this been there is, for it's such a dangerous, you know, uh, way of thinking, and uh, which which can, you know, cause a, a, a. I mean, the way they're going right now and trying to bring back that, like, I feel like they didn't learn from their history, which may cause a a, a bigger conflict in that region. Well, it's almost it's almost like what the Romans did from Western Europe all the way to Eastern Europe and beyond, yeah. right? And into Northern Africa, when you look at what, what, what the territories the Romans occupied. And it's almost like they came from the East and it, we've always just happened to be in the way. But correct, no me if I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Romans, yes, they conquered, but they didn't, um, they let the people be. They, it was just, they were under the rule of the Romans, but everybody still, their culture, whatever stayed with the pan turkism their idea is to completely destroy anything that is not turkic sure but and but and, it, and call it theirs i mean with falsification of history falsification of lands everything is theirs you know uh that's the dangerous part about it yeah you know? it's, it's like a, it's like a ethnic cleansing if you will i mean right? you go back and look at every empire even if you look at the soviet union you know it, it, they were powerful right everybody sure. whoever joined the soviet yeah. everybody was still their own state right but it wasn't like that that eventually happened yeah but the initial yeah. onset as we'll, we'll talk about in but a little bit my, my point is that even if you go with previous uh you know alexander the great when he conquered all these lands, he didn't destroy the people. He didn't destroy their cultures, you know? No, I mean, look, look, let's be honest. Even, and I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying, but the Romans did a lot of damage. They weren't saints I know, by uh, any stretch. No, 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 I'm not but, trying to say they're saints. But I've, you're right about the fact that they kind of, whoever, I guess I hate to say this, but whoever was left from mm -hmm. the conquests, they were allowed to be it's just under Roman rule. Yeah, they, they would put yeah. their own mayor or whatever. Sure. Uh, but my, my point is that, uh, listen, during battle, you have, you, when you're conquering and there's war, you have the soldiers that, you know, fight. But the regular people are still there in those cities. They have lives, they have kids, you know, they're yeah. going by uh, during their day and, and living their life. So when they did take over, they didn't, they didn't massacre them innocent they didn't massacre the innocent people no you know no, not to not to this extent yeah, the, yeah these guys are just absolutely again i don't know this is my view my opinion from no, it's, everything it's i've true. read and it's true. movies i've watched yeah of course of course yeah. you know according yeah. to according to the history that we all uh, love and know it's it is the case and we've we've mentioned it in previous episodes where even people from the west recognize yeah. the turkic slaughters and massacres into yeah. taking over yeah. lands and people was I mean, horrendous. Yep. The whole world recognized it, even from back then, right? Yeah. Uh, so, moving on here, the Armenian genocide was carried out in two stages, with the aim of wiping out the Armenian population in Western Armenia and other parts of the Ottoman Empire. Palat, Enver, and Jemal, the three CUP ringleaders, if you want to call yeah. it that, um, masterminded the genocide, wanted their agenda completed without Armenians and without Armenia. The collapse of the Russian front provided an opportunity to once and for all solve the Armenian question in Eastern Armenia. 
the last bastion of historic Armenia was still populated by what basically remained of the Armenian people. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of 1917, after the October Revolution in Russia, the Bolsheviks issued a decree of land and peace, which effectively signaled Russian withdrawal from World War I. Western Armenia, which was liberated from Turkish rule, was once again at the mercy of the Turkish death squads. The Turkish troops of the Young Turk regime, after occupying most of newly liberated Western Armenia, rounded up and killed those Armenians that had managed to survive. The Ottoman Empire tried to cover up the massacre of Armenians in Cilician Armenia and other parts of the Ottoman Empire by building a wall around the capital, Yerevan, to hide the truth from the world. Hundreds of eyewitnesses, missionaries, journalists, and diplomatic representatives recorded and made known to the world the unbelievable horror that was taking place. By 1918, the Turkish army had overran most of eastern Armenia, killing and raping en route, reaching the outskirts of Ejmiatzin. Save the holy city became the rallying cry of the last remnants of the Armenian nation. A volunteer militia began to enlist Armenians young and old, rich and poor, from all walks of life, from every corner of the world. The Armenian genocide would be the pinnacle of 1,000 years of killing, raping, I mean, everything atrocious that you can possibly, every yeah. atrocious adjective that you could throw in there. The epic battle that, I guess, call it liberated or kind of, this is where we really started to stand up, yeah. right? Um, near the village of Sartarapad, only a few kilometers from the holy city of Echmiadzin took place. The Turkish army, which was led by their notorious uh, Galibolu or Gallipoli army, um, went head to head with many volunteers that were non-Armenians who fought for the Armenian side, who, you know, people who simply hated the Turks for what they were doing and wanted to fight for justice. Yeah. You know, there's a lot which of included a lot of Greeks, Assyrians, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, Yezdis. Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of tribes and whatnot yeah. that existed yeah. in the area. Yeah. So the Armenians uh, had completely smashed the Gullibolu army, chasing the remnants all the way back to Khars. From that point on, the Armenian policy of reliance on foreign outside forces had relinquished. Um, the Armenians employed a new policy of self-reliance to a great degree, um, which is still ingrained in our people, um, in our individual psyche and collective consciousness, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. But... Through all the death and struggle and carnage, the Armenians would prevail in this famous battle and, and persevere, just as yeah. we've done for millennia, it seems. Yeah. Um, something about that, that, that you know, uh, Armenian individual psyche and the collectiveness, um, that's something that, I don't know, it comes through DNA, I guess, through all the uh, massacres we've gone through, everything we've battled, and it's something that is so beautiful when you experience it in the time of need how we come together so fast and doesn't matter what walks of life you come from rich poor uh, it doesn't matter uh, and it's and we experienced that during the and recent recently, war the 45 and, and, day war yeah, yeah and it's like if if armenia needs us doesn't matter where we are we will come together uh join you know just just it creates this amazing force um Unfortunately, you know, things didn't go our way, but that's not because of that. You know, we have a saying that we lost the battle, but we didn't lose the war. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, even on this journey that you and I are on with all this historical information, um, as further gave us an understanding that our people have just been resilient oh, yeah. for oh, yeah. thousands of years. Yeah. And again, it, it goes back to where we settled as people in a one of the most important trade routes, if not the most important trade route in world history. Yeah. You and know? you know, when, when, when the call of the motherland comes, you go. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just as we, again, you mentioned it just as we experienced, uh, in the modern day, just, you know, in the last year. Um, now after this, the genocide, um, the capital, the first Republic was, uh, established. Um, in 1918, the Turkish death squads were still killing whenever and wherever they could get their hands on the remaining Armenians. Yerevan and a small clutch of remaining ancestral land in the east would be the place during the time where the Armenians made their last stand. 
the first Russian Revolution of 1917 created a political vacuum of the Transcaucasus and the other parts of the Russian Empire. Commander Garagin Nezhde was a prolific thinker, philosopher, a writer who wrote numerous philosophical works on Armenian identity and the necessity to preserve and enrich the identity in the face of looming genocide by the Turkish tyrants and butchers. His divisions were highly disciplined and fierce fighters. His men were loyal to the end, choosing to fight to the last drop of blood. After the Reds came to power throughout most of Eastern Armenia by the late 1920s, he heroically led a last-ditch defense in Sunik, which is Zangezur, against the Turkish killers. For almost a year, he personally led the Free State of Sunik, or Lernain Hayastan, mountainous Armenia, until the newly established Soviet government in Moscow agreed once and for all that it was and always will be part of Armenia. You know, Garagin Nezhde is such an um, important figure in our history, uh, especially recent history, if, you know, talking about the 20th century. And um, I, there, there's, an Armenian, uh, there's an Armenian movie that was made. Um, I don't know if you've seen it or not. Uh, really, it's about a three hour movie or something like that. But if you get a chance, oh. it's and there's the translated version. I believe there's also subtitles. It's on YouTube. Really? Uh, watch it. It's an amazing. It goes through his life from his younger days to older days and everything he went through. And after the Bolsheviks kind of when when Armenia kind of became part of the Soviet Union, um, the way he was treated and the way he was, um, you know, and, and one day we're going to do an episode. We're going to do an episode about him. But how he was because the communists came in and their ideology didn't go with that national um what's the term like uh, nationalist i guess you can say uh the way he believes his theories that you know we mentioned here um but yeah if you guys get a chance go go search for garagin nejde movie on youtube and and watch it it's, it's a it's a great yeah. movie yeah i gotta check this out so yeah. maybe you gotta take some of your time to send me that link no no i will but uh you know and and a future uh sculpture so oh yes yes um, I, every time we mention somebody's name i get excited and start envisioning yeah, yeah. something. we'll get there we'll, we'll get, get there. there um during all this time even with um you know the Armenians standing up the azeri turks were still eager to finish the job of their cousins or brethren if you will who had just finished the systematic implementation of a horrific genocide through Western Armenia. Sunik Highlanders would go down fighting rather than see their own ed- extinction at the hands of the inhuman butchers of innocence. Um, it, it seemed like there were people who, no matter what, again, it goes back to that resiliency. They're not going to stop and they're not going to bow down. Doesn't matter who's protecting us. Doesn't matter who's standing at our back. They, it, it, it goes back to that self-reliant attitude. Yeah. You know, as humans, um, and this is not just Armenian uh, culture, it, I think when, when, when you are under threat for such a long time, you, you get exhausted. There comes a point where you just, you're like, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't care if I'm going to die. I'm going to fight for my land, my right for freedom to live and and eventually that's what happened with with armenians after the genocide it was just like okay how long can this go on i mean and before the genocide there were other massacres in the 1800s 1700s it's like this constant over and over and over and you know uh we're the type of people that you know we we were we forgive but we don't forget and i think it just piled up it was enough but you know again it's it, any group of people no you know you just like you said, when you have enough of a pushback, when you poke the bear enough, you're gonna, they're gonna bite back. They're gonna fight back, you know? With these pushbacks, if you will, on May 28th, 1918, after the Turks of Azerbaijan, known as the Tatars or Tatars, headed by the Pan Turkist Musavat Party, advocated a Turkish incursion into the Caucasus. The Georgians, had their own agreement to get protection from Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany. The Armenians, on the other hand, had gone the course of its self-reliance and eventually proclaimed the independence of the Republic of Armenia. 
By far the most gifted and dedicated member of the newly formed government was the first leader of the First Republic, Aram Manukyan, who tried to create order out of the chaos that was basically happening in 1918. Yeah. Now, after the March Revolution of 1917, which saw the Bolsheviks take over, led by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the provisional government came to power composed of a coalition of parties. Some Armenians saw the first revolution as an opportunity to fight for liberal democracy. Other far leftist leaning revolutionaries in Armenia, led by Armenian communists, wanted a revolution. By early 1920, the Red Army, or the Bolshevik Red Guards, had rapidly moved into their like former domains of the Russian Empire. The Republic of Armenia was officially recognized by the Allies in the Treaty of Severus. I might be butchering that name, I'm sorry. On August 10th, 1920. According to the treaty, the Armenians were promised um, diplomatic and military assistance from outside forces, I suppose you can call it that. Yeah, promises, um, promises. Yeah, more promises, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, this leads into the capital, the Second Republic, in such a short amount of time, basically. Uh, in 1920, still, after the bloody civil war in Russia between the Reds, which were the Bolsheviks, and the Whites, Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks came out as the victorious force. The First Republic was never able to overcome the number of critical issues, most notably that of the Turkish threat. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, by September of 1920, had assembled a huge Turkish army to the west of the Arax River, an overwhelming force against the Armenian Republic. If, if people can, Arax River runs basically from north to south, uh, which is basically considered the border between Armenia and Turkey right now, but obviously that was Western Armenia, it was part of us. So um the, can you imagine like that and that river is pretty wide yeah you know is. so you had all these forces just standing there ready to cross and 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 start taking over basically on november 29th 1920 the red army entered armenia and by december 2nd was in the control of most of eastern armenia including the capital of yerevan the government of the first republic after not receiving help from the allies as usual had no choice but to surrender government to the Armenian communists who had the backing of the Soviet Russia. The Armenian Republic remained part of the Transcaucasian SSR until December 5, 1936. After this, the USSR had adopted a new constitution which pretty much turned SSR Armenia into a separate political entity still under the Soviet Union, of course. Yeah, it goes back to what you were saying. Yeah. What we were saying earlier in the in the uh, you know in this recording with yeah. um, you know people were under a certain rule, but kind of remained a I guess a certain yeah, uh, or, yeah. or the separate entity, just yeah. like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so during this time, Joseph Stalin was in power, as we all know. The dictator of the USSR had sent millions to die in the gulags, which included tens of thousands of Armenians. Uh, kind of heartbreaking to think about yeah after this point armenians began to rebuild and heal the country underwent a radical transformation if you will rapidly changing from a rural agricultural backward country to a progressive high-tech civilization high-tech for that time um of workers tall buildings wide streets and avenues replaced the shacks and narrow streets of old yerevan and the capital of yerevan was born something about again and that's going back talk, talking about um there, there's videos of watching this development uh on youtube again you yeah can i've, I've it, actually yeah. seen those yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. and and um armenia uh, you know if if you do enough research you'll find out the the soviet union most of their industrial factories were actually in armenia metalwork uh i i mean just to name one major thing the metalwork um um, anything that had to do with construction and and you know uh, and the architecture. If you look at old Soviet era architecture in Armenia, uh, it's it's phenomenal how they did it. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, the so look, the Soviets. I mean, as far as my understanding, um, and again, I'm not like a Soviet history or Russian history major, but when you look at a lot of their cities that they had during the USSR days, a lot of the cities were almost delegated to do one specific or two yeah. or three specific types of industries yeah. you know 
automobile in one city, you know, anything to do with trains in another city, yeah. anything to do with metal or metallurgy work, you know, in another portion, they had everything kind of segmented in certain areas, right? Which was kind of interesting. Yeah. So we're willing to look into that one day. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the Armenian civilization was experiencing this sort of unprecedented renaissance. A very talented people, as you know we are, living under foreign tyranny, had a chance to build a new socialist society. New cultural and scientific establishments were found, including new universities, institutes, theaters, museums, TV, radio stations, I could go on and on and on, new publishing houses, um, numerous periodicals, and other advances in the areas of socioeconomic and political spheres. As you can see, the Armenian people, again, were resilient. They rebuilt out of dark times. Yeah. You know, here we are in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And after the genocide, they blossomed. You know, even, even under Soviet rule, they blossomed, absolutely blossomed. And um, the genocide... Uh, of their ancestors is still, you know, shamelessly denied by the Turkish government. Yeah. Um, the, as we all know, the international community, including the United Nations and the European Union, have strongly condemned the ongoing genocide denial. But um, you know, recently, uh, you know, Biden, first U.S. president to, you know, um, recognize it in a way I, to mention it. Uh, during the thing, I don't, I don't know well, if it was a recognition. No, I think it was more of a mention. It first was a, time. It, it, you know, it was a mention. And again, we don't want to get into the politics of it. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. I have, I have some very strong personal opinions about what occurred, even during the Trump era. You know, Trump did his part to mess with Turkey. We all yeah, know that. Yeah, you yeah. know, he did, and then he didn't. Yeah. And then I feel like Biden might. But again, we're not trying to get into politics, but. It seems like the moral of the story is it seems like they've used the Armenian genocide and the recognition of it, especially yeah. here in the United States. As a pawn, as, yeah. As like some sort of political pawn, like you said. Yeah. Even some of the major countries in Europe, like France recognizes it, right? Yeah. But, you know, all of them, all of their leaders dating back to uh, 20, 30 years ago, it seems like it's some sort of political push and pull with yeah. Turkey. yeah. Turkey does something bad. Hey, we're going to threaten you with this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But going back to the, the, the whole 1950s, 60s, um, you know, I, I know you weren't born there, but the nine years of my life that I was in Armenia, it was still part of the, the Soviet era. And if, if you lived and if you have any memory of that, I got to say as much as it was a communist country, right? There was something about, when you talk about the the movie theaters, the houses, the operas, the there was this this sense of pride and 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 I remember my mom and my dad taking us to see these architectural sites or to visit the opera, the movie theaters, like everything was like, uh, man, I I don't know even know how to describe it, but it felt so good that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to like find the words to describe it the right way, but it was just an amazing era to experience. And as a child, the memories I have um, are, are just, you know, I know people think about the communist Soviet union, yes. this and that. Yes. Uh, but it wasn't like old brutal old time, you no, know? No. Yeah. There was some bad things to it, but, uh, and I don't know what people thinking I'm a communist, no, <laughs> but, no, no, at you all. know, I'm just saying it's... the memory I had as a kid uh, of going out to these places and and you know the uh, the universities the institutions you know institutes the theaters museums tv ra radio stations like everything was a big deal everything yes. was a big deal you know and, and i know that i know that from you know conversations i've continuously had with my mom you know because my mom yeah. was a professional violinist you know she was born in the 50s and in the 60s she grew up basically yeah. attending conservatory yeah and to this day she still reminisces and tells me about how life was back then. Yeah. And, you know, she basically went through this, this, this renaissance. Yeah. Right. She was a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the, on the musical side. Of yeah. Things. And especially the musical side was so big. I mean, our, our, yeah, and, the, you know, the orchestras yes, we had yes. and, and they traveled the entire world by, you know, it's so. Yeah. Um, and again, I've, I've, I've kind of, I guess, call it living vicariously. Yeah. yeah yes. I wasn't yeah. born there, but again, my mom yeah. has talked to me about this for, for God knows yeah. how long. So yeah. it's, you get a taste of what 
it may have been like and, and you know then. what it was as, as kids and i remember like every child uh or i should say every parent it was like uh when you're going to school it was like almost mandatory to learn the violin which i did uh piano um uh, you had to be involved in some kind of sports something. like swimming mm -hmm. you know judo or or, or wrestling some <laughs> like there was these things and those were a sense of pride to be well, it builds, part of that well, it you know builds character yeah yeah you know for every human yeah. being well um this kind of uh leads us into the uh, the third uh portion or, or, uh, i should say the capital of the third republic uh, which is what we are. Yeah, we're you know, moving, today. We're moving we're out of the, the, yeah. the, the Soviet regime. Yeah, if yeah. You will. Uh, so in 1988, the Artakh movement spread it throughout Armenia like wildfire. After years of anti Armenian policy pursued by the Azerbaijani authorities, the Armenians of Artakh wanted to end the discrimination policy. They pinned their hopes on the reform launched by the Soviet premier, Mikhail Gorbachev. Remember him? Of course. Yeah. Who can forget? Uh, the reforms would, in fact, shake the foundation of the mighty state, bringing it crashing down. The Armenians of Gharabagh began peaceful rallies of democracy for the right of self-determination and national unity of Armenia, Artsakh, with the motherland. Azeri mobs instigated by the authorities organized large-scale massacres of Armenians living throughout the territory of Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijani Turkish thugs armed with everything from automatic rifles to screwdrivers, basically, um, attacked Armenian homes, killing, raping, and plundering Armenian citizens. Only after three days of bloodbath, National Guard units sent by Moscow, central authorities, moved in and ended the massacre of the famous Sumgait. Um, as a child, I remember these scenes, uh, and I remember the panic in in armenia of trying to get these people to come to escape and um as a child by accident i know my dad wasn't planning for but i saw a clip of them basically brutally murdering uh, an armenian woman in sumgait wow. and that image till this day i i mean i'll never forget it yeah. as a child i was, was but i think yeah i was nine i was nine years old yeah, once um, you see something like that, you can't yeah, see it. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of kids in Armenia saw this and, and it hardened them. It hardened them, you know. So I'm sure. Uh, I'm the people sure. who are my age, our age, um, remember this stuff. So, yeah, it, it was, a, it was a, you know, three days is a long time for pretty much 72 hours of just brutal massacre. Yeah, that when, when you're in a situation like that, we all know minutes seem like days days seem like years you know yeah. it just doesn't feel like it ends and time slows down yeah right um in the early 1990s the azerbaijani government had decided to again solve the new armenian question it's always some sort of armenian question isn't it with these yeah, guys yeah somehow we are always the question question right in the early 1990s azerbaijani government had decided to solve the new armenian question there's that the question. new version huh yeah, yeah the new question again um, by using the time-tested tactic, Turkic tactic of attack, which was intimidation, fear, through military force, pretty much, right? Yeah. Again, just trying to run people over. Azerbaijanis used the strategic hilltops that formed a circle around mountainous Artsakh as turrets and directed their artillery barrage of Katsusha rockets toward the civilian housing complexes. Many Armenians cried out for vengeance and retaliation. Defense forces were quickly organized. Later on, these self-defense units became the nucleus of the Armenian forces. Yeah, um, the, you know, we're talking about the rockets and, and that that's one thing that, you know, they have no re, uh, regard towards human life and, and innocent, you know, women and children. And, and we saw that happen again. You know, it's like you're bombing a city of uh, of civilians. It's like if you're going to if you're going to go to war, let the armies or militias, whatever it is at that time, let them fight head to head. Why yeah. are you hitting the innocent? Yeah. You know, that's, that's what, oh, so anyways. Yeah. I get into it. It's, um, you know, back then it was swords and spears and arrows. Now well, it's well, I'm talking rockets. about the, yeah, I'm you talking, know, it's, yeah. It's yeah. the same thing, yeah. you know, just yeah. with more 
advanced technology, I guess, yeah. if you want. The Azeri soldiers targeted women, children, in order to break the heroic spirit of the Highlanders of Artsakh. Not only did these criminal tactics of targeting non-combatants not work, it created an unlivable environment for the Armenians. One by one, the Azeri turrets that spewed death were shut out. The Defense Committee of Gharabagh organized and mapped out the strategy for the battle. On May 9th, 1992, which was, you know, as you know, V-Day, yeah. not Vic Day, Victory Day <laughs> of World War II, Armenian forces, with a loss of only a few dozen men, thankfully, managed to liberate the seemingly impregnable fortress of Shushi. For the first time, Armenians felt that it was um, th they who had to protect their own interests and their own destiny. Yeah. You know? um, to our audience, if... I, I suggest, um, I actually advise, go research um, the the way Su uh, Shushi was taken over, the way we liberated it. Mm -hmm. um, there's videos on YouTube. Um, there's there's writings about it. The way that it, it is impossible because, I mean, it's basically a straight cliff. Yeah. There's no, yes. other, and there's only one road and obviously they couldn't use the road. And, uh, and and I'm not going to get into details, but please, please go research uh, about the liberation of Shushi. It's an amazing story and obviously a true event. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if you get a moment, please do that. After this event, the, uh, the Gharabakh Committee formed from the unification of Artsakh with Motherland in Yerevan in 1989. This evolved into the Armenian National Movement led by Levon Terpetrosian. Children, women, and elders could for the first time freely walk the streets of Stepanakert without the fear of being killed or bombarded by Azeri mortar fire. On September 23rd, 1991, LTP, that's the short version for Levon Terpetrosian, was elected by a popular vote of more than 80% as the first popularly elected president of the Ar Republic of Armenia. In 1991, the Republic of Armenia proclaimed its independence after the democratic referendum held two days earlier on September 21st, which is what we just celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's the official day of the independence in which more than 99% of vo voters marked yes on their ballots for the independence. I'm, let me stop you there. You know, when I came across this information too, it's like, who, who, who out of the, you know, the 100%... <laughs> decided to mark no uh, <laughs> when it says i mean it's interesting right Nine, yeah. more than 99 percent I'm, I'm curious uh, like, who it, that who the two people I, I'm, were i'm gonna be kind and say they didn't know how to read uh, uh or yeah, just something you know there, there was a guy who pushed the button <laughs> against accidentally. The, yeah accidentally the thing against russia yeah. i'm gonna say it's one of those things they were just like yeah, yeah, filled in the yeah, wrong box yeah yeah um in 1998, the succeeding president of the Third Republic became Robert Kocharyan, who previously held the post of the president of Artsakh and subsequently prime minister of the Republic of Armenia. He was re-elected for the second term in 2003, which then led to the years of Serge Sarkisyan and then the infamous Velvet Revolution, which we saw the replacement of Sarkisyan by the current prime minister Nikol Pashinyan. Yerevan is without doubt the heart, the mind, as well as the symbol of collective hopes, dreams, and aspirations of the Armenian people worldwide. Once again, reborn out of the ashes, a thriving culture and industrial center. Today, Yerevan is the capital of Armenia. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, we've persevered. Um, through so many different tyrannical rulers, so many different people, so many different um, forces again and again and again trying to take yeah. us over. And some way, somehow, it's like, we just won't go away. Well, it's not awesome. we won't go away. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's survival. And, and, you know, when you say uh, uh, it's both externally and internally we've of had course, our own problems absolutely, internally absolutely, as well absolutely. you know uh, there's been a lot of betrayals uh throughout our history yeah. um for for because of greed uh, or just fear um but yeah that's one thing about our culture um is we 
will survive always we will fight yes. to the death uh, to make sure that our kids have a future that our uh heritage doesn't dissolve um and and you know what we just went what we just basically uh went through today is i mean it's it's a condensed version of the information that's out there you know we obviously we can't put every d but this is just to the major points as always and that's what we do with our podcast it's it's, about the major points to go through for people to and this is to help you um get motivated to go do more research and come back to us uh questions feedback you know anything of that sort we could we could turn this into a five-hour podcast if you want to yeah well (laughs) I got kids. Uh, I, I, I'm just, <laughs> it's just a suggestion, but it would, it would be really, um, there's a lot of information. So everything that we, yeah. you know, Vic and I have, have kind of condensed into what yeah. we're, we're, we're telling you is, um, a very nutshell version of, of course, God. Yeah. How many, I mean, we started around the fifth, sixth century and we moved yeah. into the current day. So that's about yeah. 1500 years of yeah. information. We're trying to cram in to get people to, you know, understand more about what we're finding yeah um city of yerevan like i said in the beginning it's it's a special place to be uh and not to uh single out any you know from the other i mean gumri is another amazing place uh anything from soon you go to sunik you know uh but uh it's a special place and uh like i said if you get to go visit uh especially to our uh non-armenian brothers and sisters um trust me you will come back with so much more love and an understanding of who we are as armenians um one thing i want to mention about next week uh vahan setian is going to be back live with us uh finally his schedule cleared up he is a busy man um and uh you know we've been in communication with him back and forth looking forward to that yeah yeah we definitely missed him uh he's gonna join us live uh when i say live we're gonna be live on clubhouse uh and this is gonna be next thursday 7 p.m pacific coast standard time uh you do need to be part of the armenia and armenians club uh so if you are on clubhouse make sure you go join that group and um uh, this again will be 7 p.m pacifico standard time i think we might even do a live instagram as well yeah yeah and uh our topic is going to be armenian language its origins and the armenian alphabet um so definitely tune in uh next week uh that's the 30 30th yeah i believe it's I believe, the 30th yeah so 30th. thursday september 30th um 7 p.m pacific coast standard we'll, time we'll we'll make some announcements yeah, on we'll our post instagram it. and our facebook yeah yeah so people people are aware of it yeah so um again uh we hope you learned something uh i know we did uh, yeah, as always as always with all the research um thank you again for joining us don't forget uh to support us go to medhedosned.com um tigran the great sculpture is shipping uh there's also vartan mamikonyan and now we have ashren uh pre-ordered guys i i we, we can't like emphasize this enough these are limited amounts once we sell out that's it so don't sit there thinking that it's always going to be there on the shelf Ashren's, yeah Ashren's Ashren's gotten a good response in the first oh my week. god yeah so <laughs> you know it, it, yeah. it, it's it's you know the price is perfect it's it's uh you know uh basically 199 which is actually really low for a sculpture like this um one thing about the sculptures all of them uh have come with a certificate of authentication they actually have a digital certificate of authentication uh, authentication within the sculpture where you scan it and it will give you your own digital version so no one can ever steal this and be able to claim that it's theirs because once you scan that it gives you the proof of it so well i mean uh, we made it as certified as possible yeah yeah so um anything else you you want to add no no No. yeah well that was uh that was great for a saturday morning uh podcast i could get used to this yeah well (laughs) i I like the thursday nights the cognac helps i don't don't have kids yeah yeah so i still have a lot things to do for saturday but 
Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, till the next episode, take care. <laughs>